Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, if you could all please uh, settle down and we'll get started. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for coming for this uh, event. Um, for those who don't know, Conservative Environment Network, we're the uh, network for conservatives who support net zero, nature restoration, and uh, resource security. Um, so without further ado, as he's a man on a busy schedule, I'm going to pass straight over to the Secretary of State for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, Jacob Breesborg. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I note that the best attended event that I have done so far this conference handed out free gins and tonics, and that this event is handing out free wine and um, a canapé, so it's doing very well on the attendance schedule. Um, but the subject is one of fundamental importance, uh, that I am, as you know, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and I'd just like to reassure you that the commitment to net zero remains. There has been no change in that with my appointment. What I want to do is get to net zero intelligently, and doing that involves nuclear power. Why? Because at the point at which electricity is generated by nuclear power, there are zero carbon emissions. And what we are going to face in this country is a situation where we simply need more energy. At all stages in the development of mankind, cheap energy has been fundamental to how we have had economic growth and economic success. If we are, for the next 50, 100, 150, 200 years, to be a successful economy, if we are to see our fellow British citizens thrive and prosper and have a better standard of living than their forebears, then we're going to need cheap energy. And the absolute cornerstone of this is going to be nuclear energy. Why? Well, because it provides part of, the most significant part of, potentially, the base load. So you can get a significant percentage of the energy that you need every day and indeed every night from nuclear power. And this is going to be a range of strategies. It's going to be the large scale nuclear power plants that we already have under construction. So Hinkley Point um, and Sizewell, very big projects. Hinkley Point providing, once it's completed, 7% of our daily electricity needs. But also you're hearing from Rolls-Royce this afternoon who have this very exciting program with small modular nuclear reactors where not only can we ensure that nuclear reactors are provided faster and cheaper. Why are they cheaper? Because they're modular. They're, as I was saying earlier, it's the Model T Ford of nuclear power. I don't know whether they then paint them black, but no, nevertheless, uh -huh. nevertheless, you can produce them much more cheaply because you're producing them on a production line. You can install them more efficiently. I, we were at an event um, immediately prior at Pulse Exchange, so I'm now cribbing the key points from what I heard there about Rolls-Royce, and um, so I'm sorry if I'm stealing your speech. Um, but, but you construct them in a factory, which saves a lot of the disturbance of the people where you are installing them, because you're not doing it all on site with all the lorry movements, all the um, employment aspects that you have near the installation site, because most of the work is done remotely. So you have less disruption as you build them, you have more flexibility, you can add to them, you can have more than one modular nuclear reactor, and therefore you can provide scale should you need it. But you can also have a fantastic export market, because the UK absolutely led the world in civil uh, nuclear power. We were the first, as everybody knows. Um, I have a feeling it was opened by the late Queen. I think there's path a role of the Queen opening the nuclear power station. I wasn't alive at the time, just um, so, so for, for, for the record, a little bit before my time. Um, but we gave up that lead, and we threw it away for no good reason at all. We threw it away because people were just a bit worried about nuclear, or they weren't willing to think about the future. And politics is a very strange occupation really, because all that we do that is of importance actually takes years to fruition and will come about when the next Secretary of State but three or five or ten is in office by the time size we'll see is completed. We are judged on a daily basis on the latest headlines in the newspapers. So we always have to keep two very different objectives in view. How do we make sure the long term is done well and won't be changed because it is robustly thought through, 
whilst also ensuring that the next day we're still electable. And nuclear, unfortunately, got to the point where people weren't interested, and therefore the big decisions weren't made. And the key point of this is, of course, from 97 to 2010, and then the unfortunate coalition, where the wonderful phrase of, um, uh, oh, what's his name, Sir, Sir Thingy Davy. Um, um, Quintin, Let, Quintin Letts calls him Archibald, but I don't think he is, actually. He's something else, isn't he? But anyway, let's call him Archibald for fun. Uh, so Archibald Davy said, there's no point in doing this because we won't have a nuclear power station until 2022. Oh, my goodness. Well, wasn't that a clever decision of his to um, think that delay was, was the answer? And so now we've got to recognize that though it's later than we would like, and though it will still take time, the best time to start is now. And if we take small modular reactors, we're talking about if we make decisions now, eight to nine years. Size will see, we're talking uh, about 12, 13 years. But we have absolutely got to get on with this because there are two visions of being green, aren't there? There is a conservative vision of being green, which is using technology, using the capabilities that we have as a country to ensure that people's standard of living continues to grow and that we are more prosperous as a nation. And there is then the Brighton, Caroline Lucas view of being green, which is that we should all become cave dwellers and turn the lights out. I am very against hair shirt greenery because I think we can do better than that and we can have positive greenery which gets to net zero whilst improving people's standard of living. And within that, nuclear power is fundamental. And we must look at all the options so I'm not saying which form of modular nuclear, small modular nuclear reactor will work. We've got to look at all of them and then find out which will. We've got to work with other nations. We've got to make an industry for ourselves that will do this so that we provide jobs in the United Kingdom. We can be world leaders once again. And the great news is, ladies and gentlemen, that you are here to support it because you are such an important part of the Conservative Party putting the case for environmentalism which is very popular with voters up and down the country, reassuring them that this is still fundamentally part of a conservative program, but recognizing it's part of a positive program, a conservative program that allows people to lead the lives they want to lead, rather than the socialist program of telling people that they've got to turn the lights out. That's where you're so important. That's where this panel is so important. Thank you very much for what you were doing and for supporting nuclear and for coming to this conference. My apologies, I can't stay. Um, my spads will tell me what I'm doing next. They always know better than I do, but thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Secretary of State. So don't go anywhere, because we're about to have a great hour-long chat of nuclear policy. Um, the wine's flowing, the beer's flowing. I promise you it's going to be amazing. But thank you very much again to Secretary of State. And, uh, yeah, we'll begin just as I sit down. Brilliant. So uh, thank you very much uh, to my distinguished panellists as well. Um, so, again, as I, as I said at the start, then is the Independent Forum for Conservatives who support Net Zero, Nature Restoration, and resource security. I want to thank Rolls-Royce for sponsoring this panel. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping. I'm going to introduce um, each speaker and then uh, let them have a, a few minutes of uh, providing their thoughts on nuclear policy just after I provide um, a, bit of, a bit of context setting. Um, and then we're going to go into some Q&A from the audience. So um, start thinking about your questions already. You can also join in the event on Twitter by tagging us in at uh, send underscore HQ. Um, we found out earlier that we were the most tweeted account from MPs um, in the last 24 hours, so nice little record smashed. Um, but in terms of setting the, the scene, the, the Secretary of State just did it wonderfully. Um, we've had a, a malaise in nuclear power since the, about the 80s or 90s. Um, and, of course, there's, there's always a big debate around nuclear. It's, it's possibly one of the, the more divisive energy sources. Some people say it's costly. Uh, they don't want it near them. It, it takes ages. It, it might be the HS2 of energy sources, if you, if you were to look at Hinge Voice C. But at the same time, it, 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 requires, uh, or it provides firm power, um, literally tens of thousands of jobs in the, in the northwest nuclear arc, um, and it gives us that energy security and reduces our dependence on uh, expensive gas imports. 
Um, so certainly a very, very important um, part of the mix. Um, and of course, we know this panel is called Going Nuclear, um, and that's what we're doing. I think the, the energy security strategy uh, released in April has um, said that we're going to be building eight more of them. But we're here today to talk about the, the more nuance and how do we bring down those, those barriers and how do we speed up deployment. So uh, first, I'm going to go to Virginia Crosby, who is MP for Honest Morn. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I've been practicing that all day. Uh, <laughs> Um, and she's also the, the chair of uh, the Nuclear Delivery Group at the APPG for Small Modular Reactors. So, Virginia, take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Pronounced um, good afternoon. A Lord Senathol, Honest Morn Dwi. I'm the member of parliament for Honest Morn, which is the best constituency in the UK, in my view. Uh, uh, I think we need to look back to why was I elected? Um, I had only really been on, um, I had hardly ever been to Anglesey. Um, there isn't one Conservative councillor. They hadn't had a Conservative for 32 years. They hadn't had a woman for 70, 70 years. It was a draw seat. You didn't even actually get that Brexit bounce. Um, at the count, you're allowed 12 guests. I didn't know 12 people to invite. I, I took my kids along and my cocker spaniel. Uh, it, was, uh, it was the biggest <laughs> shock of the general election. Now, I was elected because of one word, and that one word is hope. What I offered the young people on the island, it's got one of the lowest GVAs, gross value added, of any constituency across the UK, very dependent on tourism, hospitality. The young people have to leave the island. They have to leave, taking with them the, the precious uh, Welsh culture and the, the precious Welsh language. My dad was born in Wales. Um, my dad worked at Wilbur, which is the nuclear power station here. I hope that next time I come and speak to you, there'll be another nuclear power station here. So my dad had to leave Wales to find work, which was why I and, and my siblings have this dreadful English accent, as he would say. Uh, so I, I, I promised to do everything I could to get new nuclear back at Wilver. Uh, and that's what I've been doing um, every single day on the island and in Westminster. Uh, why is it important? It's important for, for three reasons. Um, firstly, in terms of levelling up. Uh, it's 8,000 construction jobs and around 800 um, sort of steady state jobs. And that's what we need on the island. Young people have to leave. I, I speak to apprentices at Hinkley and they say to me, Virginia, we want to come back. We're having to live uh, six hours away from our friends and our family. Um, and secondly, we need to have nuclear to help deliver net zero. Um, currently, 15% of our base load is from, is from nuclear. We've got all but one of our base load going offline. Uh, if you look at France, they've got 70% of their base load is, is from nuclear. Uh, so we need it for that reason. And the third reason that you're all very acutely aware of is obviously our energy security, what's happening with the, um, the Nord Stream gas line and what's happening with Putin <coughs> and uh, his illegal invasion uh, of the Ukraine. So for those three things, I think we need to be focusing on nuclear. Um, I hope to have, um, sorry about this, <laughs> this Tom, but a couple of large reactors at, at Wilva, but we've also got room for, for small modular reactors. Um, and I think I would like to highlight here that um, Anglesey is known as um, Energy Island. We've got wind, wave, solar, hydrogen, tidal, um, and hopefully nuclear if I've got anything to do with it. I've got, we've had 20 years of disinvestment. We've got all these brownfield sites across the island. And I think where the role that we can see uh, with, with SMRs is really um, coexisting um, SMRs with high energy uh, production, so uh, industry such as um, desalination, chlorination, fertilizer, um, data collection. And that's what I can do uh, on the island. And we've got uh, excellent sites for that. Um, the most important thing for uh, nuclear is actually having the support of the community. And I've got a community that's had decades or, and generations that have seen, whether it's been the construction, the, the uh, actually uh, running of a nuclear power station, and then the decommissioning. But I think what we can do is, with these communities that are supportive, um, it's getting the energy from A to B that is the most disruptive. So if we can coexist these small modular reactors next to heavy energy usage, then that, that way you're benefiting uh, the communities. I'd just like to say um, something about the government support that we've had. Um, we started, um, when I was elected, um, there really wasn't much, didn't feel like there was much enthusiasm for nuclear. <coughs> but it really started with the 10-point plan from the Industrial Revolution. We had the, the energy bill, um, and that's really continued. We've had the Nuclear Financing Act and, and the introduction of the RAB financing model. And then we've had the Future Nuclear Enabling Fund, which was actually announced on Anglesey, very, very proud uh, to say. And then hopefully in the next few weeks, we should have the news from Great British Nuclear in terms of our, our strategy. And that is critical. It's critical that we have a, a strategy, a fleet mentality, in order to get investment into the sector, investment into the, the supply chain, 
And I'd like to end by saying what we need next uh, from the government is green taxonomy. It's green taxonomy for nuclear. Why? Because we want to attract <coughs> pension fund money. We want to attract um, private uh, investment. We've got green taxonomy for nuclear in Europe and places like Canada, and it's about time we actually had that, that here now. So I'll end by saying my mission is to make sure that the next time you come and see me, there is a, definitely a spade in the ground um, at, uh, at, uh, at Wilbur on Anglesey, and that uh, my young people, they can, uh, we can offer them aspiration and hope, and they can actually stay on the community uh, and have a good quality job. Thank you, Jochen Bauer. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much, Virginia. Can I just do a quick check on... Uh, could you put your hands up if you think that we need nuclear to get to net zero by 2050? OK. I thought that might be the case. We're all very sensible people. Um, so next, I'm going to come to uh, Josh Buckland, um, who was a partner... Uh, he is, sorry, a partner at Think Global. He's also a senior, uh, senior fellow at Policy Exchange. Um, he's had many, many years in the government, in the civil service, especially working on nuclear finance, if I'm right. And, of course, he is also uh, one of the most infamous energy Twitter wonks. <laughs> Uh, going so, Josh, over to you. If, if actually, I might just pose a question for Gannett. So, if I'm the Treasury um, in in the past few years, and I, I come to you with my my sort of Treasury brain, um, and I go, this nuclear stuff isn't it just a bit too too costly, um, too difficult to do? Is it worth it? What what would you say to that? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's a good question. I think kind of my view. I'm not going to come with kind of an anti-nuclear hat by any means. I think kind of there's a good an analysis that shows that actually. Without nuclear, net zero is more expensive and more difficult, and net zero is a big enough challenge. The dynamic around doing it without nuclear, especially at this stage, seems unlikely. On the Treasury, and I worked there for a number of years, the, the big issue, obviously, cost is always an obvious challenge, but that's, a, that's an obvious challenge with any government policy in reality. It's not a unique thing to nuclear. The big issue with nuclear was around technology lock-in. So we've already seen how quickly technology has developed in the course of the last five years. Look at the declining costs of renewables. Look at some of the changing costs around storage. And the Treasury's concern generally is whether we're going to make a big investment in inflexible, very large nuclear power stations that consumers are going to pay for for a long period of time on the basis that actually that might be the wrong technology choice. So the real challenge, as I see it for the nuclear sector, is how can they show government both that they're driving a value for money outcome in the investment and the taxpayers' money that's being used, but also critically how they can start to develop into a whole system energy technology, both with flexibility, potentially some challenges around hydrogen, the usage of heat, and that's a conversation the nuclear industry is starting to have. But that avoids that technology lock-in concern. And also it allows you to start talking about more broad industrial strategy opportunities, which if you really look at nuclear and you look at what's happened in Somerset and you look at what could happen elsewhere, the industrial story is actually probably the strongest part of it from an economic and political sense as well. So it's worth bearing that in mind because that is something the Treasury care about. I, I, I was going to just give a little bit on the kind of challenges just that I've seen when I was in government on nuclear. But one thing I do really want to contest that I've heard a couple of times over the course of the last couple of days is that the previous government and the governments before that I was involved with didn't do anything on the nuclear agenda. I don't think that's actually true at all. Yes, there's obviously more that we could have done, but there was a concerted and quite stringent focus on nuclear delivery over a long period of time. I myself went backwards and forwards to, uh, to Japan trying to get a, a nuclear power station uh, in Virginia's con uh, constituency for some period of time. We put a lot of money on the table. I don't think it's, it's, it's private anymore that the government offered a big chunk of the, half of the equity, basically all of the debt for that project, essentially said to the developer that we would protect you in the event that there are cost overruns. And the project still didn't go ahead. And that was driven largely by the level of concern around the financial side, the risk that that comes with. We've seen whole companies, multinational companies, be made bankrupt as a result of mis, uh, mis uh, adventures in the nuclear sector is the way I'd put it. But it was also driven by a view that is the, is the government having the stability and the consistency to deliver over a long period of time? Because nuclear, as others have described, is not a short-term game. And that is something that obviously the Secretary of State talked about. How can you create that stability and consistency over a longer period of time? Because that's ultimately what you need to make these projects work. Then quickly, just on kind of three challenges as I see them, if this government decides that, it, that it's going to do even more on the nuclear agenda and, and drive it forward, Firstly, governance, and Virginia talked about this. You cannot try and deliver a major nuclear program with a bunch of civil servants, as good as they are as an ex-civil servant in Bayes, and a bunch of expensive lawyers, a large-scale nuclear pro program. What you need is a very clear governance framework. Great British Nuclear is a critical part of that. You need consistency, resource, budget. Those are the sorts of things you need to actually get this program moving. And that's what they have in other countries, what they had in Korea, it's what they've had in Japan. And that's the sort of thing that this government, if it's serious, really needs to sort out. 
Secondly, a program approach. One of the things I do regret, and this comes back to your question, Jack, on, on the Treasury, is that we always did take a one-by-one -one approach when it came to nuclear. That can't work. If you want to deliver a major program, you want to deliver multi-large-scale multi, uh, reactors and then uh, the small modular reactor program, you need to have a range of technologies. You need to have a very clear regulatory structure, and you need to give more certainty about the pipeline. Access to sites is a big part of that, and that's something we've talked about a lot recently and I'm sure we'll talk about today. So that program mentality, if you decide nuclear is a thing, that's the approach you should be taking. And then finally, finance. I, I think I, my view on finance, and Virginia will maybe disagree with me on this, is that actually, given the state of the scale of the risks and the costs involved, the state clearly has a role to play, unlike in other technologies where the costs are potentially lower and potentially more fungible. The RAB, uh, regulated asset-based financing model, good in practice, but in truth, it looks like it's going to be on the government's balance sheet. So effectively, all it becomes is financial engineering. Clearly, we're maybe too far down the line on size well to disrupt that, and I don't think we should, given the need for urgency. But there is a real question in my mind over the long term, what's the right role for the state and public investment in the nuclear sector? Because the UK would be pretty unique if it decides to go down a whole finance route. And if you've looked at some of the challenges around fully private finance models, they tend to be more expensive. So there's a good question around finance, but that is probably the most difficult quite challenge as we think about the nuclear industry. That's it for me, and very keen to get to questions. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn next to Tom Sampson, who is the CEO of Rolls-Royce SMR, our very kind sponsors uh, today. He's got 30 years of experience in the nuclear industry with him. Um, Tom, I was going to ask, uh, Britain was the first country to open a, a civil nuclear plant, um, and yet we've, we've kind of fallen behind on the, the global stage, um, particularly behind France, for example. So I was wondering, how do you think uh, Rolls-Royce, especially with the small modular reactors, which look very cool, I don't know if any of you have seen the, the pictures, but they look very, very nice. Um, how do you think that you can sort of bring British nuclear uh, back? Well, as you say, the, in the UK, we've got a very proud tradition in nuclear. We've got a great safety record. We've got a great operating fleet, and that fleet has delivered large amounts of clean energy already for the last six decades. We were pioneers back in the, in the 40s and 50s. Um, but you're right, we, we've kind of lost our way, and, and nuclear as an industry has kind of got a little bit kind of in the shallow waters for too long. So um, we then became a place where um, we brought in nuclear technology from other parts of the world. We sold off the technology that we had, and, and we kind of we kind of gave up on nuclear, and, and we dashed for gas, and then we brought in renewables, and now we're trying to catch up. Um, so catching up is not easy, and, and, and recovering that position uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but we've been developing this solution since 2015. Uh, we have retained a capability in the UK within our submarine defence programme that we've now tapped into to create a civil solution uh, for, with our SMR. And, and actually, one of the reasons why we in, in Rolls-Royce began this journey back in 2015 was we weren't actually getting any work from the large foreign technology companies that were coming here to build uh, large projects, and we felt we were missing out. And why were we trying to get scraps off the table when we can actually build our own technology and then export it. So we've tapped into that capability. It wasn't too late. Uh, we built that capability when we launched in November last year. We had 160 people that came in from Rolls-Royce. We, we benefited from, you know, as you said, uh, Josh, the government's previous governments have been supporting nuclear as well. We got single largest grant ever given to a nuclear technology company with 210 million pounds from UKRI. We've used that to, to bring in equity from uh, US, Qatar, and France, and to support Rolls-Royce and grow in the business. And today, we're over 550 people in Rolls-Royce SMR from that 160 only 10 months ago, and we'll be over 800 people by the end of the year. But we're not a technology program or an engineering program. We're a company that's been set up to build nuclear power plants and to do uh, can take a completely radically different approach to how we go about building nuclear power plants. And that's really important. And we brought that British ingenuity from Rolls-Royce and from our partners in the supply chain together to create what is effectively a factory-built commodity that, that the Secretary of State expertly kind of highlighted the potential of. And we're using proven nuclear technology that we've not lost the capability of because we've been making it for 60 years for the submarine fleet. And we've, not, we've chosen specifically to find a path to market that can allow us to go at pace to deal with the, 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 the need for, for clean energy now. And so whilst nuclear does take time, eight, nine years, we can only really start that journey when we get the commitment. So we've chosen to use proven nuclear technology with standard fuel and instead innovate in how we deliver it by building it in a factory. 
And we are probably, we were joking earlier, the largest SMR because it's about 500 megawatts. So it's very much like an existing power plant we've got dotted around the UK today. But it allows us to, at that size, build it in a factory, build a factory on site to assemble it so it has a completely different impact in terms of the, the construction activities involved. Uh, and it also allows us to do many things in parallel and reduce the timeline. So all those things help us create a lower cost solution. Uh, when it comes to base load, clean energy, you know, nuclear has a massive impact to the consumer. Um, it often gets lost in the, the uh, apples and oranges comparisons between nuclear and renewable. But renewable power, which we need lots of as well, don't get me wrong, you've got to look at that together with the system costs of providing stability and the costs and complexity of connecting the grid to those offshore wind farms. And so that holistic analysis demonstrates that we are a very competitive source of base load. And that's the economics that we'll also use to sell this technology globally. Because this is not just about the UK's need for clean energy, um, but in this current energy crisis, the security of supply challenges around the world and the important role that nuclear can play in improving security of supply and energy independence in other countries is increasing the demand for our product. And that's where our real growth opportunity is. And this, this current government are focused on economic growth and wealth creation by building factories in the UK that can make multiple units in a production line. And they are, there is only, you can have any color you like as long as it's black, as the Secretary of State said. We're making the same product time and time again. And for us, modularization is about standardization and simplification. It helps us drive down costs, helps it make it easier for us to deliver. And as a business, we take the responsibility for all the engineering and the integration, building the factories, producing the product, and building the power plant. So that also allows us to create a solution that we can take to market and scale globally, but importantly, attract capital and make nuclear investable. So making it smaller makes it easier to digest. We are actually at the scale where it could sit on a company's balance sheet. If they need 60 years of clean power and they've got a demand to feed their data center, they can put it on their balance sheet, pay for it, and take the power from it. That's where we'll ultimately get to. But for the first units to build that first of a fleet, we do need some government leadership here in the UK. Because in all those export markets where we are active today, they look to us and say, well, why isn't your government in the UK driving this forward and deploying this technology? And so getting those first few units away in the UK is really important for us to then unlock the massive export market that we can, we can address. And, and, and Rolls-Royce, we've got a heritage not only in nuclear and de developing the nuclear technologies uh, for the submarine program, but we build factories and we make large, highly complex, technology-rich products all the time. And it's that factory knowledge together with the nuclear heritage that we brought together to bring this new technology to market. And we're really in a good position in the UK as well because we've got hugely supportive communities, particularly with Virginia and her leadership in, in Anglesey and promoting the importance of nuclear. Those communities that have had a nuclear asset for the last five, six decades are the communities that understand the value in terms of jobs and skills and economic prosperity. They're the ones that are asking us and pushing us hardest to bring nuclear to their communities. Uh, and so that shows you the value that nuclear has not just in terms of net zero and security supply, but in terms of jobs, high value jobs, um, and not only on the sites, but in our factories. So we're really excited to be uh, here this week uh, talking about nuclear in a very positive environment. And I think we've seen the government every year continue to increase their commitments to nuclear, and we've seen it with GBN. Um, and I've, I've made reference many times to my time in Abu Dhabi, where they've just built uh, four large nuclear plants and delivered 5,000 megawatts to their grid in the last 12 years. But they did it by creating an entity back in 2010 that they held accountable for delivering X gigawatts by 2020. And sure enough, that accountability with the funding, they did that. And we never had that in the UK. And that's why the government, I think, have responded to that challenge by creating Great British Nuclear because they've given it a mandate. They've said deliver 24 gigawatts by 2050, and hopefully they're now, with the recommendations that will hopefully come through, put that into practice. And we want to be part of that landscape as well, but not so much focusing on 2050. We want to help bring the next nuclear megawatt after Hinkley Point C on the grid as close to 2030 as possible by going faster with our SMR. 
Thank you very much. That's uh, excellent. Um, turning to uh, our uh, last but not least speaker, we've got uh, Michael Liebreich, who um, is chairman and CEO of Liebreich Associates, um, founded by uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance. Um, he also is an advisor to the UK Board of Trade, and he has a wonderful podcast called Cleaning Up, which uh, is your one-stop shop for all your sort of pragmatic, uh, proper conversations on how to get to net zero and do the, the energy transition. So, Michael, um, as, as well as your sort of more general remarks on how, how can we speed all this up and, and do what we can to get SMRs online, um, I wanted to ask you as an as a, as a energy um, well, genius, frankly, um, <laughs> uh, how, how do you see... Uh, nuclear more widely, but also SMRs are fitting in with uh, cheaper and, and faster, but also intermittent renewables. Thank you. And, um, you know, the, the job application for my, uh, my agent, my PR agent, I think <laughs> very successful there. Um, this is fabulous. It's great to be here. Thank you very much. Um, I actually studied nuclear engineering uh, 40 years ago, and I was my, my prof, Prof Lewin, who was a great figure, wanted me to go and, and uh, do a PhD. And I thought, well, the problem with nuclear is it's a bit, it's in the government's gift. It's a sort of on again, off again career risk. So I went off and <laughs> um, did all sorts of crazy things like skiing and, and doing what I do now. Um, so I put up my hand when you said, do we need nuclear? I was absolutely, I was the first person to put my hand up. We need nuclear, right? But for the purpose of this group, I'm going to play the, the bear case to a certain extent, and then I'll come back to your question. Because I think it's really important that we remain really grounded, right? That we don't get carried away with the, um, you know, with the, with the, 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 the tide of, uh, uh, you know, um, I don't know, sentiment about what we need and where we are, uh, uh, particularly in the light of the security situation with Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. It's very easy to sort of, jump to deciding that we're making these huge commitments. So if we want to be brutally realistic, nuclear, these big projects are really difficult to deliver. Right? Olkiluoto in Finland is 13 years behind mm. and 8 billion euros over budget. Flamanville, the flagship of the EDF technology that we're building at Hinkley C, is 9 billion euros over budget and 11 years behind. Hinkley, you'll remember we were supposed to be eating turkeys in 2017 cooked with electricity from Hinkley. Uh, if we're lucky, we'll get that in, what, 2027? And it's £5 billion over. And if anybody says, oh, well, that's just because in Europe we're rubbish at this stuff. Um, Taishan, China, was brought online, is offline. You know, it probably will come on again because it's just a fuel issue, but still... And the South Korean uh, technology in the UAE, in Abu Dhabi, uh, which Tom mentioned, I mean, it was cheap. It was the cheapest uh, bid, but it then emerged that it was using non-certified components, and there was, it was linked to a secret military uh, defense contract as well between the South Koreans and the UAE government. Um, in the US, Votel, I think it's how it's pronounced, um, started off the first one, 660 million, became 14 billion. Uh, the last two uh, reactors, estimated price, $28 billion. So big gigawatt nuclear, we shouldn't pretend is easy. It isn't just a financing question. Um, and then um, if you look at uh, the small modular reactor, now everybody's excited about small modular, and I made my entire career around tracking experience curves, how the costs come down. I spotted that solar and wind would get really cheap and batteries, and so I'm a, I'm a huge... Uh, fan of experience curves and learning and so on. But I want to quote Admiral Rickover said something very wise, and he was the father of the US Naval Olympic, uh, Olymp um, Naval Nuclear, sorry, I don't know what I called, uh, the, the Nuclear Navy, right? He was the guy who pushed through the Nuclear Navy. And he said, the perfect reactor of the future, um, one, it is simple, two, it is small, three, it is cheap, four, it is light, Five, it can be built very quickly. Six, it's very flexible in purpose. Seven, very little development is required. And eight, it is not yet being built. Whereas the actual nuclear plant, one, it's being built now. Two, it's behind schedule. He was writing this in, in uh, the 90, I think it was in the 1950s. Three, it requires an immense amount of development on apparently trivial items. Four, it's very expensive. Five, it takes a long time to build. Um, six, it's large, it's heavy, and eight, it is complicated. And I'm not sure, I think it would be very optimistic 
to assume that those challenges are not, are, are not current. Now, what does that mean? I did put up my hand, and I do think we need to do this. Uh, but I think we need to be realistic. Ultimately, it comes down to the economics. It comes down to what is this going to cost? Right? There's a few other things I'll, I'll come on to briefly. But the answer is, if you look at Hinkley, £92.50 per megawatt hour in 2012 money. Right? That's already £115 per megawatt hour. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with megawatt hours and prices and all the rest of it, but that is three times the cost of offshore wind in the most recent round. Three times the cost. <coughs> okay? And then there are other um, baseload options. I declare my hand. I'm an investor in one of them, a company called Xlinx that wants to bring in renewables from North Africa, wind and solar in Morocco, with a little bit of batteries, dispatchable renewable energy, fulfilling the same function in the electricity grid as nuclear, but for 48 pounds per megawatt hour, so less than half of Hinkley. And we can say, oh, well, with the little clever stuff that Josh um, talked about with a regulated asset base and some financial engineering, which you don't like, but maybe we'll do it anyway, probably. <laughs> Maybe we can bring down that cost. We can bring down that cost. We'll also learn because we'll do further projects. But could we get it down from 115 pounds in today's money to 80? Yeah, I think we probably can. Can we get it down to 40, 50? No, forget it, right? Now, maybe with the experience curve by 2050, maybe, but it would be very brave to say so. Now, the other thing I just want, before I get on to why we still need to do it, Baseload is dead. Baseload is dead. And the reason it's dead, that, I mean, that's a very provocative way of putting it, right? But what is baseload? Baseload is the minimum level of demand at all times of the day and night. And the way you used to design electrical systems is having big, cheap, inflexible plants, coal and nuclear, that just ran all the time. And they met baseload. But the modern world, the technologies we've got, the cheap wind, the cheap solar that we've got, and it is cheap, it is on and off like this. And so there are times when we're producing more wind and solar than the economy needs. If it's not happening just yet in this country, it will be soon. And what we need is flexibility. We need technologies that can fill in when there's no wind and when there's no solar. A technology that has to run for the economics 24-7, 365, is as useless to the national grid as a technology that is not there when you need it, right? So what we're going to do, the way we're going to provide energy security, people immediately say, ah, we must have storage. No, we're going to have a whole range of approaches. We're going to have storage, pump storage, battery storage, hydrogen storage. We're also going to have interconnections to other countries, right? We're going to have more cables to more countries. And we're going to have demand response, being able to switch things off. And that's where nuclear, to come to your question, is really going to come into its own. What we need is those nuclear plants, whether it's a big one or whether it's a small one, we need it fundamentally to be supplying industry. And by industry, I might, it might well be hydrogen electrolysis. And nuclear has a huge advantage in that sort of role because it loves to operate flat 24-7. And do you know what? So do refineries and so does hydrogen electrolysis. And those uses require heat as well. So you can take the heat out of the nuclear and you can take the electricity and you run it 24-7. How does that provide the flexibility that you need? Well, for two of it'll, and that probably would be more expensive even then, your hydrogen or your whatever would be more expensive than if you just ran it from wind. But let's say there's two, three, four weeks a year where there's no wind, no sun in winter, and the wind drops. And that is when you switch those processes off and you switch the nuclear to keeping the lights on. That's when the electricity prices shoot up and nuclear can suddenly make so much money in those two, three, four weeks that the whole thing makes sense. 
Now, that's my vision. That's why we, we also need it for defense. We need it for medical uses. We need it for the food industry. We need nuclear, right? But when we think about whether it's regulated, asset-based, whatever, however we're going to get the policy framework to work, think about that use case, that, that pattern of use. We have to be flexible. We have to be able to switch it over between industry and the grid. It needs to be flexible, the mechanisms, the support mechanisms, the frameworks, the finance, in order to use it that way. Otherwise, we're going to end up with one, two, or three white elephants nowhere near the 24 gigabits <coughs> that are the targets. Sorry, I've taken too long. No, that, was, that was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm just going to, before I come to the, to the audience, I'm going to um, ask the first question. It's going to be at Tom and Virginia. So um, one of the, the biggest problems that we have in general in this country, to be honest, is that it's just very difficult to build things that we need. Um, and it's, it's often down to community support. Now, Virginia, I know uh, in Ernest Morn, people are, are very much up for it because they've already had it. But how do you think across the rest of the country where we're going to need to build other nuclear plants, um, how do you think we can win consent from those communities to, to have it built? I think there's an issue of um, levelling up, and this is a key focus of the government's agenda. If we look at the places that have existing nuclear power stations, they are all in coastal communities. These are communities that are, have a very low GVA gross value added. They're one of the first to be affected by COVID. They're the last to actually see um, sort of any benefit as we've come out of COVID. And these are, you know, these are, these are really, really tough times for these communities. So I think that's the first thing, is actually using existing sites. And one of, I've actually um, written to Bayes and actually said what we should be doing is looking at some of the decommissioning sites and actually we've got the support of the community there and actually let's put the new the new um, the new nuclear plants there and I think this is why SMRs actually work quite well um, in terms of these sites um, but I think in terms of the um, the the, the uh, sort of leveling up I think the SMRs are a really good opportunity for us and instead of importing energy from yeah. France it's an opportunity for us to actually put these put the SMRs um, in uh, uh, you know in areas that need leveling up and in areas where we've um, got high energy use uh, use industries Brilliant, thank you. And um, Tom, do you have any any thoughts on how to overcome nimbyism? Oh, um, I'm still uh, reeling from Michael's uh, <laughs> <laughs> comments, and uh, hope I can feel free to address that as well. Yeah, let me have a go at addressing some of those because I think, uh, I mean, look, the, the reality is nobody ever said it was easy, but that doesn't mean to say we shouldn't do it. And thankfully, people like Rickover did demonstrate it was possible. They were the pioneers of not only uh, nuclear civilian uh, solutions in the U.S. but also. Uh, some Marines, and uh, they were the Rickover was a man who decided that Rolls Royce should be given the permission to build nuclear reactors in the UK. So um, we shouldn't let um, uh, challenges and, and failures be a barrier to the future. You, I don't disagree with many of the challenges you mentioned about nuclear large programs. They're really a lot of them are down to uh, construction complexities and scale. And the, uh, the pursuit of economies of scale to go larger and larger hasn't borne out because the complexities outweighed the perceived benefits, and so you end up with delays and cost overruns. So we actually are responding to that challenge of large, uh, and there are some success stories in there, um, but generally, large is not only difficult from a construction perspective, but it's hugely burdensome to finance. Now, we're talking about 20 to 30 billion pounds of funding for each large program. And that means it very much is in the purview of government to make happen, uh, and it does then take, take a long time. So we've tried to respond to all those challenges by building something in a factory and creating a factory-built commodity that can then bring those benefits of lower cost deliverability forward, and then we can still benefit from nuclear. Because nuclear today accounts for about 10% of the world's electricity, but 40% of the world's clean power. And so it punches way above its weight. In terms of terawatt hours of clean energy, nothing can touch it. And if we want to get to net zero and we want to address climate change, then we've got to embrace these challenges. And quite frankly, no, renewable will push us into a greater uh, need for baseload. So I think renewables might wish baseload would die and go away because it makes it harder for them to make a case without being uneconomic by adding in batteries and other solutions to make it compete in a baseload space, and they don't want to have comparisons with baseload power because it makes them look uneconomical. But we do need baseload. We do need to have flexibility, and we have to have a mixture of a variety of sources of energy to make that work. And we have got the ability in the UK to embrace nuclear and export nuclear to help other countries address that challenge. Because just solving this in the UK isn't going to address climate change. We've got to make clean, affordable energy 
accessible in much wider markets. And we have to therefore get behind this technology and this solution. If, we, if you're a really strong environmental advocate, then many of the strongest in the community around the environmental world today have come round to recognizing the importance of nuclear. Uh, and I think that is the only way we're going to really tackle climate change and address net zero is by fully embracing nuclear, even though it is difficult and even though it isn't going to be easy, uh, it must be embraced if we're going to tackle this, these existential crises. Thank you very much. I think another country that's realizing the importance of nuclear is, is Germany. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've, yeah, just, go I was just going to add that the two statistics. No, the government has already responded to the energy crisis by a 60 billion pound measure in the UK today. Think how much nuclear power plants we could have built, even with some of the cost overruns and the challenges you mentioned, Michael, that would have isolated us from that. How much has France had to spend in this energy crisis to respond to these challenges? A much, much smaller number. Germany is having to commit £200 billion this last week to address this energy crisis. So these are the issues that we're trying to address by pushing nuclear faster to come online to help isolate us from these types of exposures. Thank you. Um, so where is the microphone? Ah, it's coming from the back. So a couple of gentlemen caught my eye just before um, getting in early. I like it. So there's uh, this gentleman at the front, uh, and then we'll go for the gentleman behind him, and then the one in the in the middle aisle. Yeah. Um, I'm saying I'm not into nuclear, but I'm slightly startled that you've been talking now for half an hour, and nobody said the word waste once. Um, <clears throat> Tom will be aware. Every nuclear submarine we've ever built in this country still exists, and is rusted in a dockyard, and has been there for 40 years. How do we stop creating the same problem for our grandchildren? I think it's a great question, and it is, it is part of the reason why nuclear has not been built out as much as it should have been in the last 20 years, where in the meantime, we've continued to burn fossil fuel and created a different waste problem on a different scale that we're all dealing with. But in reality, the nuclear industry is the only energy source that fully accounts for, regulates, funds, controls, and manages the entire waste cycle. So we know where all the waste is from every nuclear power plant that's generated power in this country in the last 60 years. It's controlled, it's regulated, and it's stored. And eventually, there'll be a long-term geological disposal facility in this country and in other countries to take that storage of waste off the power plants and put it into a place for the long term. So I, I agree with you, waste is an important aspect to this, and the costs in the UK of every nu nuclear power plant includes what's called a funded decommissioning plan that bakes in like a pension pot the cost to decommission those sites and deal with that waste legacy. Because we didn't do that properly in the 50s and 60s and we've had to address that. But waste, if you really are you know, concerned about the environment, nuclear waste shouldn't be the reason why you're afraid to embrace nuclear. It's the only source of energy that fully accounts for the consequences of its waste that it produces. And it's been the reason why nuclear hasn't been built out as much in the last 20 years. And as a result, we've created a different waste issue. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to take a few questions at a time just so we can make sure we can get through because there's a sea of hands just a second ago. So there's a gentleman um, just behind. Um, and then I'll, I'll go for the one in the middle aisle as well. Thank you, Chairman. Um, David Smith, I'm Chairman of the Tamworth Conservative Association and a County Councillor. Mr. Sampson, I can't wait until I have my neighbourhood nuclear plant. And I'm 100% in your court, and I will support um, the project in every single way. When I look at the talk about the baseline of consumption as it stands us at this moment, we have every opportunity today. My home tomorrow, I could go and reduce my energy consumption by 30% with products that are here today on the market. Now, if we combine that with low-cost energy overnight and at certain times during the day, which some companies are saying that they're going to offer, then we could look at recharging, for example, <coughs> battery energy overnight and at top up, top up during the day, maybe even solar, although I'm not sold on that. Um, we could start to do something to level things out, and I think that's important that we do that, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then just a question just in the middle of the aisle, gentleman with the tie. There's a lot of gentlemen with ties today, so... <laughs> <laughs> mm. okay, well, the Thank you. Color of the tie. I think... I'm very pro-nuclear, and one thing that's just taught is I never listen to Nick Clegg ever again, or the <laughs> Liberal Party. <laughs> yeah. That's the rule anyway, to yeah, be honest. Yeah, <laughs> never listen to them. Um, my question is more sort of semi-technical, really. One is, does SNRs need to be near a river, a large river, or near a coastal thing for cooling? 
There's that thing. And the second question is, what's the role of micronuclear, where you have like 20 megawatt submarine type reactors, where you may be building a new development, and that's an ideal for central district heating, as well as power generation, or airports in the future, who may want to generate hydrogen for hydrogen fueled airplanes. So I just want to view on micronuclear and technical question is, is are we location limited because of cooling capacity to where the SNRs go? Thank you. Josh, um, just as we haven't heard from you in a while, would you like to take that question? Yeah, no, of course. And, and just on, 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 the, on the first one, just around kind of the opportunities around demand reduction, like the government should be doing far more on demand reduction. There should be clearly a kind of some sort of campaign this winter around how um, individuals can be supported around demand piece, because that's really what we can do in this near term. And there's been a little, very little on that. And as you say, flexible demand, which then shifts demand into the laterals of the day is, is right. The reason I think there is a good case for nuclear is just the sheer number of terawatt hours you need by 2050. If we're going to electrify transport, if we're going to electrify, electrify at least portions of the heating system, the sheer amount of terrible hours you need is so significant that there's still a good case for nuclear. I, I, I they do buy this a slight argument from Michael, but it needs to be a little bit more flexible in terms of how it's designed and beds itself into a whole system where it's doing different things at different times of the day. On the on the point around, I, I'll let I'll let Tom come back on the rivers point because I, I confess I don't know. But on the micro nuclear point, I think there is a potential opportunity around industrial sites for sure. I think that's potentially quite an interesting idea. High temperature heat potentially as well in the future, as well as kind of baseload secure energy critically because industrial capacity obviously relies on that and that potentially is an opportunity the one thing I would say though is that small capacity will still require clearly licensing challenges around delivery and just a sheer back to the point around terrible hours the sheer amount of electricity we need we can't just rely on very small installations it's got to be a combination and, and, and as Thomas flagged his, his his SMR is not necessarily small yeah, um, and Tom, I might just add to the river question, if I may, if it does need to be near rivers, because uh, we've got a, a wonderful Sen Nature team, and they do a lot of work on rivers, which have been very topical um, recently. So if it, is, if it does need to be near a river, um, does it also uh, have the potential to pollute that river, or can we keep it clean? So a num number of points here to unpack. So it's a great question. And I think we, we, we're looking at deploying, and we can deploy as many as 38 nuclear SMR or our SMRs on the existing nuclear estate today. That's the NDA's estate where there's been the AGR, the Magnox fleets. That's a state that's been identified for large programs that haven't gone forward yet, such as in Anglesey. Uh, and so there's many, many sites around the coast that have already either had a nuclear power plant on it or has planned to build a nuclear power plant. So they are already on the coast or on rivers or lakes. We have made a decision, partly because of the difficulties of environmental permitting, to build mechanical cooling towers that can be modularized to then provide most of the air cooling for the power plant and only require then about 15% of the water you would need if you were pulling all the water in from the river or the sea. So we've already minimized the impacts on the environment by going with a cooling tower uh, solution. Uh, and we've already made other in design decisions to minimize the, the, the waste products that come from the power plant in terms of the various gases and, and, and nuclear uh, materials that are involved in, in, inside the technology. So we've already gone with a very environmentally light impact in terms of what we're bringing, bringing forward to market. Thank you very much. I'm going to go for another round of questions. Um, can we go for these two um, people just in the UK to save you from running in? And there's a gentleman at the front. So, yes, yeah. Um, I've got a question actually building on the waste question. It would be really interesting just to understand the volumes of high-level waste in particular versus the low-level waste, because I think that's quite an important issue to pick up on. And also the suitable bedrocks for... Um, kind of long-term permanent storage as well, and what that looks like in the UK in terms of availability. Uh, how I understood this, uh, uh, this problem of uh, energy crisis now, it's actually is not, uh, not from here, it is somewhere from Europe, from Germany actually. And uh, could you clarify one thing? Uh, what is that German obsession uh, against nuclear power about? <laughs> Yeah, I recently had a, a discussion with a German people, one German man, somewhere, and, uh, and uh, for a long time, about 10 years, I, I'm, I'm uh, thinking about this, why they are so much about uh, against nuclear power, and actually now they even use coal, but still uh, nuclear power stations are shut. And uh, can can Britain do something about this? Uh, something like uh, uh, discussing with them what is this about? Because it actually they're causing problems. Uh, this is not a <coughs> problem. 
Brilliant, thank you. And I think there is a, another question just at the front here. Yeah, thank you. Yes, good evening. This is a question about delivery. Tom, you mentioned seven to nine years from now to delivery under current circumstances. If you were allowed to go as fast as you could, how fast could you actually deliver? I, how much of the critical path is due to regulation and other effects? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Tom, would you like to take the, the suitable bedrocks and the, the high level, below the level uh, waste question as well as how, how fast can you, can you bring it online? So I think the, the, the high level waste point is a really good one. Uh, the spent fuel uh, from a nuclear power plant um, then gets put into a dry cask storage and goes into long term geological disposal mm -hmm. facility. Uh, just to give you a sense of the scale, I'll give you two statistics. If we run one of our SMRs for 60 years um, and that's enough power to power a city the size of Leeds, the entirety of that spent fuel pool would fill a swimming pool. If you relied on nuclear power for all of your energy needs for your entire life, including your car, transport, data centers, everything you use, the amount of waste that would be attributed to your use of nuclear for your entire life would fill this jar of water. So that's the scale of the waste. Uh, it's very manageable. It's highly, as I said, regulated and controlled, and it can be, uh, you, can, you can go to power plants where they've stored the nuclear waste and it's in a room and it's in a dry cask store and you can stand next to it and it's entirely safe. Uh, the geological disposal facility locations are being consulted on right now with the government uh, and there are, there are many uh, rock repository uh, systems in the UK that can host this that's seismically inactive. I know for a fact there is you no know, great locations, for example, in West Cumbria and, and there's three or four others that are seismically disposed to the stability needed to be able to be a long term geological disposal facility. So we, we have those rock formations within the UK. And then the point on going faster, I think the, 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 the ability to cut through, and by the way, not reduce the regulatory burden or oversight in terms of standards or performance, just accelerate the processes, could, no, you mentioned seven to nine years, it's the difference between seven and nine. So if we can take away a lot of that uh, regulation, if we can find ways to start earlier in the process, we can get as close to 2030, 2031 as possible. Yes. We, we're advocating doing things in parallel. Nuclear power in the UK, we've done in series. Do the planning. Well, get your design done. Do the planning. Get the funding. And it could take, no, Hinkley took about 12 years before they started to pour concrete. Sizewell is going to probably take eight, nine years. Uh, we don't need to wait that long. We're trying to advocate doing things in parallel. While we complete the design and secure the GDA from the regulator, we'll be preparing the sites. We'll be building the factories. We'll be creating jobs in those nuclear communities. And we'll be ready then when the design is f uh, further along to start manufacture in the factories we've built. So doing those things in parallel also allows us with an SMR program to significantly reduce the schedule. Sorry, I need to get on to other questions. We're, we're working with them now on that exact strategy. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Virginia, I'm going to turn to you um, on, the, on the question of what, what uh, the delivery group that you chair, as well as the, the um, all-parliamentary group, um, all-party parliamentary group, sorry, on, on SMRs, what could they be doing to help speed up delivery um, at all? And also um, on the Germany question, yes. you can answer that as well. Thank you. <laughs> Great question on Germany. And, and it's, it's, it's incredible to see um, if we had Caroline Lucas, Lucas running the UK, which situation we would be in. Uh, you know, you've, got, you've, got, you've got Germany uh, right next to France, and France has got a completely different approach to nuclear. You know, with 70% of their base load, they announced another um, six uh, nuclear power stations. Essentially, you can start in the, uh, you know, you can start working in a nuclear submarine and do that for a couple of decades, and then you can move into the, the nuclear sector in France. But I think this is really a, an issue of, uh, of our energy security, and what we're seeing is uh, Germany has not future-proofed its energy security. They're having to backtrack now. Uh, they're doing this quite quietly, actually, uh, by um, sort of, um, sort of uh, just keeping nuclear power stations that they were going to close actually keeping them running for a little bit longer. So they haven't quite, um, uh, quite, quite ducked the question now, but I'm expecting, we're expecting them to, um, to actually be looking much more uh, towards uh, nuclear. And of course, here in the UK, we're not as exposed to, uh, to, to, the, to, the, the, um, to Putin uh, as Germany, and we're in a very, very fortune, fortunate situation uh, there. Um, your question about the, um, the nuclear delivery group, uh, this is a group of Judy Harrison. Um, she is my fellow atomic kitten. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, no, I, don't, I don't particularly like that, that moniker, but uh, to be honest, anything that gets the profile of nuclear up is, is, is sort of fine by me. Um, so we set up, we, we, we realized there was an issue. There was an issue uh, with that actually bringing all the, all the parts of, of, of nuclear together. A lot of it was about the skills, a lot of it was about the regulators, a lot of it was about the developers, uh, and also to um, how we could actually help them within Westminster. So we set up this, uh, uh, the, the nuclear delivery group, and, uh, and we've got, uh, we, we set about actually having a, a strategy as to how we could raise the profile uh, within, uh, within the chamber, within the House of Commons, with, it, with, with ministers. And so if every opportunity, we've worked together, we've got together with um, written questions, debates, written questions with, with Treasury, and also doing um, uh, adjournment debates. We've been doing Westminster Hall debates. And it's been absolutely fantastic to see um, all of us working together. It's a very siloed industry. Uh, and um, the, one of the uh, um, benefits of COVID is obviously the advent of Zoom. And so, literally, we're getting these people from all over the UK and, and sometimes from overseas who've got expertise in the in the nuclear sector, really working together uh, and actually trying to push the agenda forward. And I'm delighted to see Great British Nuclear is headed up by a Welshman, uh, Simon Bowne. And I'm really, really looking forward to actually us having a strategy over the over the next uh, over the next couple of weeks. Hopefully, it will be announced. Thank you. And uh, yeah, no, Michael as, as well. Just very quickly, um, in answer to Germany. Um, the climate side as well, if you could, as, as they said, they're turning on coal plants, if you could mention that too. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so Germany, and I've been um, talking, tweeting, railing against the idiocy of switching off perfectly good, safe, low cost nuclear in Germany for 15 years I've been doing this. And when I say low cost, set aside all the questions about whether it's expensive to build or not expensive to build, right? But when you've got it, and it's fully depreciated, and you're already storing your waste, however you're storing it, then adding a bit of incremental waste doesn't create incremental risk, and they're switching it off. And I've, 15 years I've been saying this is absolutely ridiculous, and, uh, and have had absolutely no impact whatsoever, sadly. And what Germany has been doing is actually exporting. You ask the question, why are they so anti-nuclear? I think a lot of it is to do with the, national, uh, with the history, that the nuclear industry is a centralized industry. It is affiliated alongside military industry. And so the anti-militarism of German youth in the 1960s kind of got a bit of, I mean, I don't know what to say, out of control. They, are, they exported their anti-nuclearism and uh, were trying to influence through the EU other countries. And that has now stopped. So whether they, they will retain their last two plants, maybe three, maybe six if it gets really, uh, you know, but probably two or three. And hopefully they will stop trying to export their brand of anti-nuclearism. But I also want, if I might, to talk about France because what we can't do is say, ah, and France got it right. As we speak, 56% of French nuclear reactors are offline. And they're offline for planned maintenance and they're offline because of corrosion. One of the problems with programmatic nuclear, which we want to do, is that you have programmatic sharing of risk between multiple power stations. So when one gets a crack, they all have to be taken offline to inspect. And that's what's happening in France. In the UK, Virginia, you say that we are not as exposed, but sadly, gas sets the price of all of our electricity for many hours of the day. And when France, if you want to blame somebody for the high prices of electricity this year, it is Mr. Putin's fault. It is the bounce back from COVID. It is also Mr. Putin's fault. But it is also the French. Right? Why? Because we are exporting electricity. They are sucking in electricity from us, which means that gas is performing that marginal role for many more hours per day than it would normally. That is costing us. One day there'll be a PhD or a master's study on how much the failure of French nuclear power stations cost UK households, and it is hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Finally, just on the speed point, if I might, because it's such an important one, I'm, and I'm the biggest fan of both of my colleagues here on the panel, Tom, Virginia. I am your no, I biggest fan. Right? I am a nuclear kitten as well, right? <laughs> but we've got to be cold, and I'm also a numbers person, right? Yeah. And the world needs, it, it uses 30,000 terawatt hours of power per year, right? One gigawatt scale reactor produces 
8.8 terawatt hours each year, which means that if you were to build gigawatt scale power stations, you would need 3,400 of them to replace the world, to provide, to meet the world's energy needs, right? If you use the not so small, the medium sized modular ones, the Rolls Royce ones, you're talking about 8,500, right? So if we get the first one, as the Secretary of State said, in eight or nine years, maybe in six or seven years if we go absolutely pedal down, right? And then we start rolling them out, you need to do 85 of them, 85 to produce 1% of the world's electricity. And don't forget, we're electrifying transport and we're electrifying heat as well. So 85 gets you 1% of today's demand, probably gets you half or a quarter of a percent of the demand in 2045, 2050. The challenge is huge. We should not kid ourselves. A fabulous market. Tom's doing all the right things. And so is Virginia, so is everybody working on getting this done. But let's not kid ourselves. This is not anywhere near the whole answer. Not anywhere near. Agreed. Agreed. Um, just very quickly, what's programmatic nuclear in a sentence? Programmatic nuclear. Doing the same sort of power station again and again and again. Yeah, so yeah. you can roll it out like solar panels. Yeah, no, I was always wary of the window. Um, so, uh, so another round of questions. So Ed at the back. That's okay, Katie, and then we'll uh, go for the, the person in the middle as well with the dress. Hi there, uh, Ed Burkett from Onward. Just a question on cost transparency. Uh, do we have any sense what the cost per unit, cost per megawatt hour will be of the first SMR? And does the panel agree that if we go for the regulated asset-based model, we still need to make sure that we have transparency on costs and therefore, we should provide an equivalent pounds per unit, pounds per megawatt hour figure for all nuclear power stations funded under the RAB model. Thanks again. Uh, I think that lady over the dress had a question. Hi there. Um, Beth and Davis, I live on Anglesey. <laughs> <laughs> um, Anglesey is, the people of Anglesey have been waiting for 20 years now for Wilver B, Wilver now with something. Um, and we continue to wait. And I'm interested in Virginia and Tom's opinions about whether we, if we assume a, a general election in 18 months, are we going to get a decision on Anglesey within 18 months? Will we see spades in the ground or at least some sort of confirmation? Thank you. Yeah, the way I'm going to do this, so Virginia, if you could um, come in on that 18 months question, then I'm going to go to Josh for the RAV transparency one, and then Tom, if you could do the 18 months one and also the cost transparency. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Bethan. Um, I, I, in terms of um, Wilbur, will we have a spade in the ground by the next general election? Well, I really, really hope so. Um, I, I, I don't count my chickens before they're hatched, uh, but I, I think the fact that Wilbur was <coughs> energy security strategy. Um, I think the fact that the support we've had from government uh, has, has been phenomenal. Um, what I'm looking for is uh, we've got Sizewell C is now going to be uh, up and running. And so actually the next focus of attention should be should be Wilver. And I'm really, really hoping that we can actually get this green taxonomy uh, through. Um, I think it would be a great question um, is actually for Tom, is actually to ask Tom in terms of Rolls-Royce investing, uh, investing on Anglesey. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh, well, again, it's, we're, we're, we're looking for customers to buy our technology, so we need the developer on Anglesey to be our customer. But I think Anglesey is, uh, is in the running for being the first place for deploying this technology, like, along with your friend and maybe erstwhile uh, competitor for that status in West Cumbria. But sighting for us is, is really about where we go first, but there'll be opportunities for SMRs and all those nuclear estates around the UK. There's prized states that should be used they've got water they've got grid connection we've got nuclear communities nuclear skills nuclear uh experience so we should be putting smrs on all of them fantastic and job uh josh sorry the the rab transparency question yeah no I, I, absolutely on just on the on that i think on the cost point generally nuclear always costs more than we think it will at the outset and kind of michael's described that at the beginning and there is a real challenge around cost control and that's because they're huge construction sites if anyone's been and i've been to 
uh, Sizewell as well as Hinckley about 17 times with various ministers, they always show you the size of the construction project. And that's absolutely clear. And that is why they cost more, because they're complex engineering as well as very, very difficult civil construction. So we've got to be clear on the cost base. And that then requires us to think quite carefully of how we protect the taxpayer if we put money into these projects. So it's always worth having in the back of our mind. We should never be overly optimistic on cost grounds. On the transparency side, I think I've, I've talked a little bit about a regulated asset-based model is effectively financial engineering if it's on the government's balance sheet. And therefore, for me, actually, the real debate is actually not around necessary transparency. Why fund it through consumer bills? Because ultimately, funding anything through consumer bill is regressive. So if we are going to take a decision to effectively fund it through a part government investment, then let's think quite carefully about whether we should actually fund it through bills. And government's already taking action to take green levies off bills. So they've kind of already won that argument. And then just quickly on the on the, on the the Wilver point, why, the reason I think progress in the next 18 months is so critical is because Labour's nuclear policy will be to nationalise effectively the process. And that will put us back by three years. It will cause all sorts of challenges around the interventions in size well and potentially quite significant challenges for Tom and the world of kind of private sector developed nuclear. So the critical thing is that they're bound in by the time that election comes on, in the fear that Labour take over. Thank you. And, and Tom, just finally on that, on that transparency point, if you may, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to close because we're coming to time. Well, uh, just talking about the LCOE then, just to go back to that question on the, on the costs. And assuming that we've got, well, the biggest part of the financing uh, a nuclear power plant influences the LCOE. That's a big, big factor. Uh, if we look at the, with the fleet approach, we expect the cost to come down by about the fifth, sixth unit. And so we do get the benefits of that fleet build out. So if I look at the first, say, four units then and we kind of look at the average cost across those first four units which starts to see the fleet benefit and we assume we finance that with debt and equity so the weighted average cost of capital is about nine ten percent then we expect that lcoe to be less, less than 70 pounds a megawatt hour and hinkley's right now about 125 so that's cheaper than than, than large nuclear by a margin and back to michael's point if you try and compare that with other forms of base load which are clean renewable plus storage or CCUS plus plus, then you can you can start to then see that as a competitive solution at around about 70 pounds a megawatt hour. If you look at the RAB model, what RAB does, it does two things really well. It takes away the need for interest during construction, which reduces the financing costs. And because of the way the financing is structured, it offers a lower cost capital solution to help make nuclear cheaper. And so that takes about 25 pounds, 30 pounds off those numbers. So you can be below uh, £40 pounds a megawatt hour with a RAB solution uh, and potentially even lower than that uh, towards 30 uh, as you build out the fleet and start to see the better economies coming through. Uh, and I will make one other point, which is mentioned, you mentioned Okolotu, uh, and you mentioned if you've got 20 megawatts, 50 megawatts, the model in Finland is called a Mankala model, where you can invest equity to get a share of that power at cost for 60 years. So then you take out the equity return and you can be even below 20 pounds a megawatt hour. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've come to time. I know there's loads more questions, but do come up and um, have a chat with the panelists after. Um, so thank you very much to Rolls-Royce for sponsoring this event. And Save your claps, because I'm just about to thank my, my wonderful panelists as well. <laughs> um, uh, please do, we're going to have a, a break, but then at eight o'clock we have um, the Great British Farming Market and we're going to have the Environment Secretary. So we're going to have the Bay Secretary and the Environment Secretary. It's a real hotbed for Secretaries of State um, this evening. So thank you um, to everyone in the audience. Thanks for coming. Cheers. <laughs>